Hello, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm I'm going to talk about the um, pavement material construction and testing. So uh, this uh, chapter is quite big, so I'm not sure whether I can finish in one session. So I probably will divide into two session. So the first part will probably be about the pavement, different type of pavement pavements, and then up to the um, uh, the the spreading of the aggregates for the pavement materials and then uh, the compaction of the pavement materials okay so um, let's start <coughs> okay uh, the pavement types the pavement pavement types uh, usually consist of two types uh, the flexible and the rigid pavement so you can see that you know the on the left hand side is a flexible pavement and the right hand side the rig, the rigid pavement. You can see that um, on the for the flexible pavement we have the um, what's that the one the uh, the sub the sub best sub best and the best cost. Uh, but here it says that layer of sand, gravel, and crushed stone. So if you look at the two, uh, the, uh, the two types, the two um pavement, okay. So um the rigid pavement have less less layer than the the flexible pavement, and the different the main different also the the top part the wearing cost, uh the the rigid pavement, um is made of it's a concrete slab, um. In this case, in on this diagram, it actually shows there's a steel rod. Okay, as uh, at the time, the the rigid rigid pavement can be just a mass, just mass concrete. Okay, the flexible pavement uh, on this side, um, on the left hand side is the um, uh, layer of uh, asphalt. Okay, um, it could be uh, the rigid pavement. It could be chip seal as well. So the flexible pavement um, usually surface with the the bituminous or asphalt material. So it could be spray seal or chip seal, or it could be asphalt for high volume rod. Okay, so um, you can see that you know the um, the the top left corner is the asphalt rod, asphalt. So they have the um, this um bituminous mixture okay, of um um the bitumen and aggregates and then the fillers and air voids and the bottom right is the chip seal rod so this one the chip seal rod is just um uh, how how they do it is that just they spray the um, a layer of um the bitumen and then followed by the a run of the chip the chips on the rod and then followed by compaction. <coughs> uh, this type of pavement are called a flexible since the total pavement structure bends or deflects due to the uh, the traffic lots. Uh, the um, flexible pavement by its name is so flexible that means it can, um, it can deflect it can deflect. So we look at the um, the two type of pavement, the rigid pavement, concrete, and the on the left hand side, and the flexible pavement on the right hand side, are uh, actually under the wheel and under the tire. You know the um, when the when the tire run over the flexible pavement, actually it will just um sink, it will just sink down, and then and then it will bounce back again. Okay, so whereas for the rigid pavement, usually it, it doesn't deflect. So for the flexi flexible pavement, the asphalt when it's when it's uh all um edge, then when it's become become oxidized or become um brittle, then it has problem. So it, when it get all, so it, it cannot bounce back so easily. Then we we have problem with the edging and then the cracking as well. <coughs> Flexible pavement is very common in New Zealand. Whether it's uh, the NZ NZTA, the state highway, or the 
all the roads for the for the council, district council or city council, they use a lot of the flexible pavement. Um, on the other hand, the rigid pavement are composed of the um, Portland cement concrete surface course. Okay. Um, the pavement is the rigid pavement um substantially stiffer than the rigid than the flexible pavement due to high modulus of flexibility of elasticity of the of this uh, the PCC material. So the concrete slab, you know, you just you can just imagine, you know, in the building, it is very rigid. You, it cannot it cannot just deflect like the um, the asphalt. So it's it's much stiffer. Okay. Further, uh, this pavement can have reinforced thin steel, which is generally used to reduce or eliminate joints. Okay, so um, the rigid pavement, um, we have, in this case, we have this a lot of rebars, you know, the rebars, the, the longitud longitudinal steel run along uh, inside the patch, and also they have this, uh, uh, the, uh, the transverse steel as well. For the shear, um, I think for the shear to for the shear, for to to resist the shear shear stress. Okay, so um, uh, for for the main highway, they usually have the steel rebars, but sometimes um, they could use the mass concrete. But if you you just use the mass concrete, your your slab need to be thicker. <coughs> uh, in in New Zealand. At this stage, I think we don't have m many concrete pavement. Okay, only they only use it for the like the private pathways, and and I think at the moment there's not not many concrete pavement. Only one or two around New Zealand, but in the olden time there was quite a lot of uh, concrete pavement. Okay, but the concrete pavement pavement is very popular in the overseas country because of it. It um uh long design long long design life okay because com comparative comparatively the um, rigid pavement has a much longer life than the uh, flexible pavement <coughs> okay each of these pavement types distribute lots over the subway in a different different fashions okay the rigid pavement because of the high elastic modulus um, uh, modulus tend to distribu distribute a lot of uh, relatively wide area of subgrade. Okay, so uh, the concrete slab itself supplies most of the rigid pavement structure capacity. Okay, so most of the look at the right hand side, the rigid pavement, it has a big area of um, the loading, the spread along quite a big area, and most of the loading is taken up by the the rigid the concrete slab. So you can see at the bottom here the the um, most of the loading is taken by up by the concrete slabs. <coughs> Whereas for the flexible pavement, it use uh, uses a more flexible surface course and distri distributes lots over a smaller a small area. It relies on a combination of uh, layers for transmitting lot to the subgrade. So, um, in comparison to the the rigid pavement, on the left hand side is the flexible pavement. So, the 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 area for the for the um, traffic lots is uh, smaller. So, um, so the magnitude of the force. Or, or the pressure is much higher okay uh, also in com in comparison uh, the, um, the 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 layer of the the two types are different on the left hand side the be the um, uh, the flexible pavement it consists of the update the uh, the surface cost and followed by the best cost and sub best and then the natural formations the subgrade on the right hand side, uh, the top layer is um, the concrete slab, followed by sub base, okay, and then and the bottom and um, and then is um, the formation level or the subgrade.
uh, the flexible pavement generally generally requires some sort of maintenance or rehabilitation every 10 to 15 years uh, it has a much shorter life <coughs> comparatively uh, the flexible pavement um, lower lifespan lower strength high maintenance cost rolling rolling of surface is needed damaged by oil in certain chemicals on the other hand you look at the, the rigid pavement lot transfer is not it's it's not exist high strength lifespan is is much longer so it so sort of it can be like um 40 years lifespan low maintenance cost okay it it can last a, a lot quite a long period of time without any maintenance <coughs> rolling of surface not needed no damage by oils or grease so the concrete doesn't get damaged by the oil or grease <coughs> so rigid pavement uh, compared to the um, flexible pavement it can have a uh, 20 to 40 years life with little maintenance or rehabilitation so so the rigid pavement a lot of time used in the urban or high traffic areas um, because in the for example in the on the on the motorways expressway there are multi lanes maybe four lanes five lanes six lanes and we it can't possibly have um, we come do maintenance frequently so we we don't want to we probably we you know we have we need a long um long period without any maintenance okay so but however however the rigid pav the rigid pavement is not available available much in new zealand <laughs> but naturally there are threats of threats of for example when a flexible pavement requires major rehabilitation the options are generally less expensive and quicker to perform than for rigid pavement so for the um, flexible pavement the the upside is that you know if there if we have we need to uh, repair we need to do maintenance or rehabilitation actually it's a uh, cheaper cheaper to do uh, and quicker to do than the rigid pavement okay the rigid pavement uh, will last a long much longer time but when it's time for the um, maintenance it will be more expensive okay and and i think you know for for example for new zealand it has some um earthquake earthquake risk earthquake if there is some earthquake coming if you have the rigid pavement if the pavement road pavement uh, get damaged then it is quite quite hard or quite tedious to repair the pavement you know but first for the flexible pavement they can just you know just um, clear up the debris and then to relay the rod relay the the the, the rod again do the pavement again and and lay another layer of asphalt you know it's, it's easier first for the rigid pavement you got all the steel rebars to take care of Okay, the video i think you just uh, look at it later on you look at, at yourself on the, so i'm not going to look through the video for the rigid pavement uh, restoration <coughs> flexible pavement structures okay a uh, flexible pavement structures is typically composed of several layers of material each layer receives the lot lots from the above layer spread them out out then pass on this lot to the next layer below so um, the 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 lot the spreading of the lots um, you know it, it is not um, perpendicular downward sorry it's not vertically downwards but you see look at the area the this are uh, the stopping line the dash line so uh, the lot is spread from uh, the wheel you spread um out uh, so sort of, uh, spread out it's not so the lot the lots traffic lot is not particularly downwards so it's spread out and 
that means that the pressure at the contact point is much greater than the than the next layer the sub the best and then it's spread out further in the sub base and then even more in the sub grade okay so you can see the um, the two layers um, one is a a is a thick structure b is a thin structure so for a thick structure the the pressure or the the stress on the sub grade will be smaller compared to the thinner structure <coughs> So further down the pavement, the structure of particular layer, the less lot in terms of force area it must carry. Uh, bituminous, bituminous surface treatments such as spray seals are also classified as flexible pavement. So the flexible pavement, um, you could have the you know the asphalt or it could be like spray seals, you know, chip seal. Um, Anything the bituminous mixture, you know, they 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 all consider as the um, flexible pavement. <coughs> a typical flexible pavement structure consists of surface cores and underlying base and sub base cores. Okay, just like I think we 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 seen through previously. Um, I think we we'll, we we'll look through again later on, like this one surface cores. Best cost and sub best. <coughs> so all these three layers, all these layers, uh, these layers contribute to the structural support and drainage. So structural support, I think you we, we all know. You I think you you can you can understand because the, all the traffic loading will be uh, spread down. You know is transfer from the surface cost the asphalt layer and transfer f down to the the best cost and then further down to the sub best and then finally to the sub grade okay <coughs> the surface cost is the stiffest as measured by the resilient modulus and contributes the most to pavement strength so comparatively speaking the um, surface, the surface cost, the best cost, and the where, and the sub best. The surface cost made of um, like say the asphalt is a, is the strongest, so it take up most of the load. Uh, the production of the asphalt. So we we have a look at the production of asphalt. I'm going to look at the um production of asphalt. Um, let me see. Spin. At Wolf Paving, we take asphalt seriously and are proud of the asphalt we produce. Wolf Paving is a third generation family owned paving company that's been in business since 1941. To produce our asphalt, we use various sizes of aggregates and two different sands, manufactured and natural sand, depending on the mix being produced. The aggregates are loaded into the feed bins and the computer controls the amount of aggregate that goes into the asphalt mix. An infinite number of mixes can be produced based on the job specifications. So the, the aggregates then come out onto the conveyor the and go into the dryer to be mixed. Recycled materials play a key role in environmentally the friendly the solutions. The Wolf Paving recycles 100% of the asphalt the removed the from job down. sites, as well as concrete and asphalt shingles. Wolf Paving also uses a new warm mix technology to produce asphalt at a lower temperature to help save fuel in the environment. After the aggregates have been dried and, and mixed, the, the two recycled the products are added and the oil is injected. Drum. The recycled products go into the collar, which is about two-thirds of the way down from the dried aggregate. Adding the recycled products after drying the aggregates keeps from burning off okay, any residual the oil. Recycled. The last 10 feet of the production so system is where everything is mixed, in. heated, so and dried. This is, is, is also where the required the amount of oil is added to meet the, the job specifications. The final product is sent up the slat conveyor and into four silos. Up to 1,000 tons of asphalt can be held at a time. When the asphalt is in the silos, it is ready for distribution. If you are okay, so this about the asphalt production. <coughs> okay. Um. 
the underlying layers are less stiff but are still important to pavement strength as well as drainage and frost protection okay we'll look at those later on um, so typic, uh, the typical um, structures of the uh, the flexible pavement is i think as i mentioned earlier is usually that um, they have three layers okay the su surface cost best cost sub best and then the subgrade just the net, the ground surface that we need to be well compacted to receive the the pavement. <coughs> okay, first we look at the wearing wearing or the the surface cost. <coughs> okay, the surface cost is the only uh, is the layer in contact with the traffic lots and normally contains the highest quality materials. So. In terms of cost, the wearing cost, the sorry, the surface cost is the most expensive in top like per meter, per meter square, uh, of or per, per meter cube. Okay, compare compared to the best cost or sub best, it is the um, the extract is the most expensive. It provides characteristic, uh, such as friction, smoothness, noise control, rut, and shoveling resistance and drainage. So the um, what do you say the uh, the friction smoothness noise control rub and shoving resistance and drainage. So this is the friction. You know we look at the um, uh, if you look at the rod on a big picture on macro scale, you see the rod is a bit the, there's some roughness. You know it's a bit rough. The rod is not. Uh, when you go down to the mega structure, mega texture, you look at what it should be made of a lot of the, um, the texture, the protrusion, the, the chips or the aggregates, which um, sort of uh, come out from the surface. If you zoom it in, which is called a um, microstructure, sorry, macro, um, macro, M A C R or macro structure, you, you see all the, the aggregates, bigger aggregates. So this one they provide all the macro uh, micro macro structures. So it's a see the rod is rough. And then if we go to the individual aggregates, which is down to the micro micro texture, so you can see that you know the each uh, aggregates it could it could be smooth or it could be rough. Okay, so this provide the friction. Uh, which is necessary for braking, you know, in the, for the skid resistance. When your car, when your car, you you need to stop. Um, during the let's say you you there is a obstacle in front. When you want to stop, you have to stamp on the brake, and then the car will come to a standstill within the um, within the uh, the what's it the side within the stopping side distance. Okay, so be. So hopefully you don't hit the obstacle in front. Okay, so that's um, the rod we need to provide the friction. However, uh, the rod, um, the rod surface, some of them is smoother or rough. Usually, like for example, the chip seal, um, it can be quite rough. Chip seal is usually uh, rougher than the rougher than the the asphalt. So usually, like in the urban area the asphalt usually is quite smooth and then it's it's quite it's quite quiet whereas you know if you go to the let's say the residential area the chip seal especially it's newly like uh the chip the chips then you can feel that it's, it's quite noisy you know the the tire noise the chips you know the road the road surface quite uh quite um quite noisy so smooth truck smooth texture of the rods and powers as well can reduce the rod surface noise okay so we will look at that uh the um, certain type of uh asphalt for, them, for example the porous asphalt actually it can has it's much quieter quiet rod than rod surface than the other type of asphalt <coughs> and um Smooth rod has uh, less tear and wear for vehicle and shorter time to destination. So if you're a new good rod, usually you cut down the the time for traveling as well. So you can 
save the fuel, save the you know the the fuel for the car, and save the tank way, and then let's tank way for the vehicle as well. Okay. Um, also, the road sometimes um, the asphalt. Uh, what what do we say? Um, rot and shoving resistant and drainage. <coughs> <clears throat> so the rod, uh, this rod is badly uh, rotted, you know, the, so because of the, the wheel track, you know, this, this rod, uh, the, all the, probably is some really heavy, heavy uh, truck running along, That's, this two depression is the, the wheel track, the, the tire, the position of the tires, but uh, generally, you know, comparatively compared if there is, uh, you know, the um, um, the good rod, usually they have provide a lot of um, rod resistant. So the rod which usually will take, um, probably this one will take a long time to 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 come to this stage which so which need to be repaired. Uh, you know, possibly there's a lot of maybe something like big logging truck only running over many of them in a day. So there'll be a lot of damaged by the rod, by the trucks. <clears throat> okay. In addition, it serves to prevent the entrance of excessive quantities of surface water into the underlying bass, sub bass and sub grade. Okay, the, so the, where the surface cost will do that. Um, this one probably this one is uh the rod is the rod surface is not that good because of the cracks usually but usually when there is n no cracks it usually is uh quite water resistant it's not totally it's not waterproof it's water resistant so actually it can prevent the um, the water from from going down to the bottom layers so you know but this this one this rod is shows that the cracks you know. After a while, you know the rod there will be cracks. But usually, when the rod is good, usually there's it, it has no cracks, so the water will not go able to go down. And this this uh this this diagram show the um the the what this one the moisture from different areas from the verge from the high area seeping from high ground and even from the below uh, the water table by capillary action and so on. That, that, that can sort of um, wet the um, subgrade, okay, which made the sub subgrade um less uh bearing bearing strength. <coughs> so the top layers um of material sometimes is divided into the wearing cost and binder binder cost, okay, uh because usually we say the wearing cost, but the wearing cost. Uh, which which for usually is when we talk about the uh, wearing cost and binder cost, we mean um, the asphalt. Okay, asphalt. The chip seal we we, we won't say them as um we just say the um one layer or two layer of a, a single layer of chips chip seal or multi or two layers of chip seal. So. But when we say the wearing cost and binder cost, it means um, uh, the edge fell. Okay, so um, we usually have, um, you look at the, the bottom uh, diagram, we have this uh, surface cost and the binder cost. Normally, you know, the, the surface cost is the one that take the blunt of the traffic of the tires. So the aggregates need to be very tough to, to resist the pollution of the of the uh, the tires and <clears throat> and the binder cost is also the um, uh, asphalt uh, but it doesn't need to have the the toughness the, the uh, I mean the the aggregates doesn't need to have be that tough because it's not it's not directly under the 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 polishing action of, of the of the tires so so actually, you know, the, the aggregates, the tougher the aggregates, it will cost more. So the binder cost, we, we so with um, not so strong, tough aggregates, usually it will cost less. So 
the normal practice is that we have a thinner surface the this on the wearing cost okay so here they just put surface cost binder cost but up here you see that uh, the wearing cost and the binder cost okay so normally the wearing cost is um, thinner compared to the binder cost but both of them they'll carry the that's quite strong in carrying the traffic loads <clears throat> wearing cost is in direct contact with the traffic loads which it is meant to take the blunt of the brunt of the traffic wear and can be removed and replaced as it becomes worn the binder cost provides the bulk of the surface cost each chief purpose is to distribute lot okay actually um in talk in talking about the taking the traffic lot lots both the wearing cost and the binder cost they they, pro they are almost the same uh the, they're the same lot uh cap capabilities so but um the binder cost is cheaper because the aggregate is um it's not as tough as the wearing the but aggregates in the in the wearing cost so it's cheaper so we use a cheap we have a thicker uh web binder cost to reduce cost okay <coughs> the next one down is the best cost <coughs> the best cost is immediately beneath the surface cost it provides additional load distribution and contributes to drainage and frost resistance so it's a uh, provide the um, uh the Lot distribution as well as drainage and frost resistance. <coughs> so, uh, the frost the frost action, you know the, um, uh, this one this will happen in the temperate, um, uh, temperate climate when the, when the, <coughs> surface can, can go below zero degrees. Can okay, you know what happen when the, when the ground become, when the water, uh falls below zero degree it will become ice so you know if the inside the um for the best inside the um there will be a lot of this void air voids so the water it will it will put it will be inside the inside the voids but for best cost um usually it will not fill up all the space so um when the when the uh the water expand when it's become ice because uh, you know the the volume of the ice is is bigger than the volume of water you know the, because the, the ice is um uh that's why you know the ice can float on the on the on the water so because its density is lower so it has a bigger volume but because we have we have a lot of void um so we can actually so we call it the frost resistant so uh, because of the the best cost because of aggregate because of the presence of the the air void in the aggregates it will provide the frost is resistant <coughs> okay best cost are usually construct out of the aggregates okay the best cost are construct out of aggregates best costs are most typically construct from durable aggregates that will not be damaged by moisture or frost action aggregates can be either unbound or bound okay so um the the aggregates the best cost or the sub best it could be bound or unbound okay if bound you know the um, uh, the bound sometimes it can be bound or it can be unbound best bound bound means that you know the um, it's tricked you know the um, asphalt uh, aggregate mixture or asphalt treated granular material so the is bound it could be it means that, that we add something add some additives it could be uh, bitumen it could be cement uh, it could be other thing as well uh, other because uh, it's cementitious like some of the material are fried fried ash something like that first for the unbound best and sub best best and sub best so this one is untreated 
so the bats and spats cause they are not treated they are just aggregates been spread on the rod you know by the uh, by the machine by the bind the grader or the spreader and then and then the compact by the roller there's nothing we don't add any cement or don't add any uh, bitumen to it <coughs> okay in certain situations where high best stiffness is is desired best cost can be bound with bitumenous or cementitious stabilization so sometimes um, for example the the road with a high traffic volume uh, motorway or freeway we need we we don't want to have a a pavement is that is very thick you know uh, we if it's for unbound pavement we could be it could be very thick it could, it could be as thick as like one meter uh, one meet, one meter deep so if we want to reduce it we need to strength we need to have um, um, higher strength best best cost or the sub best then we can add something like you know we can strengthen the um, the be the best cost with the like, bitumen uh, bitumen or the uh, cement or black ash sub best uh, sub best is um um so below the best cost is is a sub best okay and sub best sub best is between best cost and and the sub grade <laughs> so it fun the function of the sub best is structure support okay all all the all the different layers of of the pavement there they they need to be the, pro pro providing the structure support. Also, it minimizes the intrusion of fines from the subgrade into the pavement structures. You know the fines. That means that, um, uh, for example, the fine usually the fines usually from the um, subgrade when when it's wet. You know, then usually they got some mud. Mud is that is a fines. You know, clay. It can go inside the um, uh, the pavement. But you because you have a um, best cost, uh, so. It probably, um, sorry, because you have best cost and sub and the sub best, so the um, fine will not go up further up to into the sub best or, or go up to the the varying cost. So it be just limit down to the sub best. So so it minimize the intrusion of fines from the subgrade into the pavement structure. That means that it's a the structures higher up, the best cost or the varying cost. Also, it minimize the frost action, same as the best cost. You know, it can minimize the frost action and provide a working platform for construction. <coughs> so, usually, like a construction site, um, the you, the the project site, this are the building sites. Um, then they need to have access road around it, um, and for for the transportation of materials for the vehicle to the um, to go around they need some sort of some rods around but the contractor is not going to build a, um, a new rod around the, the the building you know because if you do a new rod the rod with a varying cost you know it's very nice but you know it will get damaged uh, at the end of the project you know or the or the construction traffic you know or the big the cranes whatever uh, the heavy trucks come in, you know, by the end, by the by the time you your your project is finished, your building is finished, the road may be uh, sort of a damage already. You have to resurface again. It costs more. So what the contractor do is that they just provide the sub base as a working platform for the for the construction um construction vehicles to use the as a access road. <coughs> So the sub sub best generally consists of lower quality materials than the best cost but better than subgrade soil. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the uh, the the cost of the material will will go will de will will decrease from top to bottom, um, because the sub best usually has a is a bigger bigger size aggregate. When compared to the sub best, sorry, when compared to the best 
best cost. When the the bigger aggregates usually is cheaper cheaper than the smaller size aggregate because the um, smaller size smaller size aggregate need to be um crushed by the quarry more. So they so the the smaller the 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 aggregates it will cost more because it, it will have further quarry quarry action. So so in terms of the size of the aggregates usually you know for the the aggregate the um, sub best will be biggest sometimes we use uh, like 75 mm uh, size and then go up to the um, the best cost sorry the yeah the best cost it could be about down to about 30 35 um, mm uh, size and then if go up to the h file h file probably about just the aggregates in the h file just about 10 10 mm 14 mm so the the aggregate is getting smaller and smaller okay go the when you go up so the this um the next two video I, i'm not going to show you can you can look at it at your own time about the we will show some of the things also in similar things later on about the road best con con uh, compaction and part meal as well later on okay so um i'll see how much we i can continue um because now i think now it's about i have done 45 minutes so we continue to look at the uh the placing the sub best and the best cost material the placement of the granular sub best and best cost can be undertaken by either by greater greater or mechanical spreader so uh the the top one is aggregate spreader you know the this one is just um <coughs> uh a box a a bi a, a bins with the with the tie, with the wheel in front and the, at the back there's some is um bulldozer is pushing the thing you know i think it's so sort of connected to the bulldozer the connect to to the blade of the bulldozer it just push along and then the thing just the aggregate can just drop down you see look at the right hand side there's a bigger uh dozer and then the and then the truck is uh, mounting is just of um uh connected to the this on the hop hopper it's just um um sort of um lot some of the the aggregates on the beam beams bins so so the so the the bulldozer is pushing it along and at the same time it's spreading the aggregates so we can look at later on there, there i think there are some video you can look at it and the bottom part is the grader um the grader so they are they can spread the aggregate as well you know aggregate it can spread either the aggregates or the soy okay <coughs> so um <coughs> Both plants can place either soil aggregates or crushed rocks. Okay, so both the uh the this one the mechanical spreader or the grader they they are capable of uh placing the soil aggregates or crushed rocks. But usually the here it says the general practice is to use grader for spreading soil. Uh, whereas for the the aggregates. Which is called a crushed rocks. Um, it's uh, it's better to spray by the mechanical spreader. But I think we we see a lot of the time, people that uh, the contractor contractor they just use the grader to spray the aggregates. But you know it's it's um it's recommended you know the from the uh from the point of view of the which is more efficient which is better it better uh the best practice actually the aggregates should be spread by the mechanical spreader whereas the uh the soy the for subgrade you know we you can shape the shape the cost for of the subgrades that one is better done by the grader <coughs> okay placement of the grader placement by grader okay so even though it's not the best practice but a lot of the aggregates has been spread by the uh the by the grader so uh, for the placing by the grader so the um, 
the how the aggregate is been spread is there are few things, uh, A B C D E, dumping operation by the truck. You know the the truck will dump the um, chips on the road, and then the um, spreading operation, uh, performed by the um, grader, mixing and water watering. Um, sometimes the water truck can will be able to spread some water on it. But usually, you know, before the aggregates been carried by the truck to the site, it has gone through the um, some water mixing already. So they pre-mix the, um, the, um, the aggregate with some moisture, some water. So because we usually we don't want to uh, spread a very dry, dry lots of the um, truck, truck lots of these um, aggregates. Usually it needs to be a, a bit moist. Okay, for better compaction. Okay, F uh, D is compaction and then shaping to ensure the correct levels and cross for. So you can look at the uh, this v the placing placement by the grader. I just look through the uh, placement by grader. Let me see. Aggregate spreader. <coughs> okay, this one. the the grader is spreading the thing the 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 the, 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 the roller is coming along as well because when the, the spreading is being done the, the roller will come and do the compaction Okay, the spreading by the prop, uh, prop self propel spreader. Um, okay, the the spreader the, the spreader it could be a self propel or it, it could be um, pushed by some uh, some some machine machines. Okay, so it is a purpose built machine capable of laying materials to a specific thickness with a minimum of materials. Minimum of material handling and um, manual control. But I'm going to show you actually for this uh, spreader, which is um, not cell propel, not, not cell power, but it's pushed by a bulldozer. I'm going to just go up. <coughs> uh, aggregate spreader.
Okay. We have to go a bit faster. Um, moisture con moisture control and, pa and particle distributions. Okay, the, um, we need to put s do some moisture control for the aggregates, you know. When placing the crushed materials, moisture and particle distribution need to be controlled to keep material segregation to a minimum. Um, this this thing segregation, uh, you know the the um, if you look at I don't have any diagram to show at the moment. You know if you put the cement, you know sorry not the cement the concrete. If you if you um, you you pour up uh, you pour some concrete on the on the on the for the beam or columns. Sometimes you know the there be some segregation because because the, the aggregates there are different sizes. They got big size uh, and a small size. Usually the big will separate. The big one will go down faster because of the you know um, uh, the gravity. So so leaving the top layers with uh, small aggregates, the the bigger aggregate will sink to the bottom. So so in a way, uh, when you do the spreading, uh, because you you have add some water to it as well. You know we 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 add some water to the aggregate. So in a way there will be some separation of the. The aggregates, you know, the limit segregation. So the bigger one tends to go down to the bottom, leaving the uh, the smaller aggregates in the bot at the top. So we need to, uh, so control it, make sure that we don't we don't have too much segregation happening. The materials need fit to the mechanical spreader must be at the correct moisture content. So what is the mo the correct moisture content? Let them we look at that. Uh, it need to be like op optimum moisture content. Look at that. You know the, um, we, there's a graph show graph showing the the moisture content on the the horizontal axis and then the dry density. So a certain uh optimum moisture content um that could be de have to be determined like from project to project. You know it could be like three percent. You know. So you need to add water like three percent um, moisture content for the aggregates, so to provide the optimum, um, uh, not optimum the maximum dry density. So we, we need the things to compare as densely as possible. <coughs> okay, any variation in moisture content can cause vibration variations the thickness of the layer to occur due to the changing the force acting on the floating squid. When crushing products are taken from stock pile, they normally require remixing due to segregation which which has occurred during the placement of material in the stock pile. So usually when the crushed product, you know the stock pile, they stock pile it then um, uh, to stop how before you place you before the placement on the um, on the rod they need to be remixed again <coughs> the operation is best undertaken using a part mill uh, to recombine the material you know we need to because um, you stop how it actually there, there is some seg separation uh, segregation that means um, then the side the aggregates the the biggest bigger size I, I, aggregate tends to go uh, at the bottom leaving the the smaller size at the top so they need to be remixed again so the part mill we can do the job so I just show what's part mill
that I put in the bins. So they they put in the bins. Uh, so the this is the stop power stop power of the aggregate. So put in the bin and then remix again. Okay, and so there might be some segregation, but also also when they remix they they add some water to it because the the the, the stop power the material is the stop power could become very dry already because of evaporation. So they need to. Before they uh, they bring the the aggregates to the site for spreading uh, and compaction, they need to remix with water. <coughs> okay, so the water can be uh, add, added to the to the to the aggregates at the at the part mill. Compacting of pavement materials. <coughs> okay. Um, generally accepted that the performance and service life of a pavement will not be satisfactory unless it is adequately compacted. Okay. So, if you don't compact the pavement properly, there will be uh, the rot will not last very long because the I think the um it need to be properly compacted um the to remove all the to remove most of the avoid need to be. Otherwise, you know, if it's not compacted properly, the thing will sink. The pavement, it will continue to settle. Thus, the object of compaction is to reduce the void contents and thereby enable the mechanical properties of the material to be fully realized. The use of high quality materials in pavement construction has required change in the compaction technique and equipment take into consideration the following, you know. Um, the relation um, the relationship between the moisture content and the state of compaction. Just now we talked about this. You know, we need to add water for compaction. We don't usually compact with a dry, dry aggregates. We need to add some, some water to it. For example, you know, uh, different de depends on different mix. It could be two per two percent of moisture or three percent of moisture, add to the aggregates and then, uh, to for compaction, um compaction by the roller okay <coughs> the compaction procedure uh, the object the objective of compaction is to improve the material properties uh, in particular uh, to there are three three objectives first is to increase the to increase its strength and bearing capacity secondly is to reduce the compressibility of the aggregates so it will not be compressed further again that leads to decrease its ab ability to absorb water. It's not totally the aggregates. It's not totally water. Um, far from waterproof, you know. It, it's a uh, water probably. Um, if you compact well, actually it it will resist the passage of water. You know to decrease ability to absorb water. So these are the three reasons, th not the three objectives of compaction to increase the strength. And bearing capacity to reduce compressibility and to, to decrease its ability to absorb water. The compaction process artificially densify the granular materials by pressing the particles together, expelling the air from its mass and filling the voids, thus making the materials more dense, more strength, and resistant to rotting. And the two Critical factors that will control the compaction, I think as we mentioned earlier as well, the moisture content of the material. So we have, if we have the uh, the right moisture content, we can pro produce the maximum dry density, which is desirable. And particle distribution of the material. Um, normally the, the, the aggregates, they are not one size, single size, they are a mix of um, Different different sizes. Uh, the we need the uh, I think the part, if you do the particle size analysis, you see that using different shapes, you see that how many uh, percentage passing through um, for this size and how many percentage for that size. You know there are a mixture of um, 
different sizes. For example, you know, you you aggregate is uh, forty mm. It's not only forty mm. It can be uh some things. There are a lot of some smaller, uh, smaller aggregate size in in the, uh, in the mix in the in the um in that stock. Okay, there are even some uh quarry dust as well. Uh, selection of compaction um, equipment. We have um, different type of um, compaction equipment. Um, first is the vibratory compaction. I think secondly we have this um, static compaction or static rollers. <coughs> the two principal types of vibratory compactors. Uh, first is the drum rollers. Secondly there is a plaid compactors. The plate compactors is just a very small machine for compacting the building site. You know, for example, you, that is a very for a very small job or for some pavement, for some uh, road repair, just a very small area. For big area, you need to use a drum rollers. Okay. <coughs> uh, the most suitable vibratory roller for the compaction of crush and uniformly size grand size. Non coercive material use um, contact effect. You know, they got this thing. The there's some vibratory vibration. You know, the um, uh, thousand seven to three thousand cycles per minute. You know, the drum they can vibrate the drum, and they got amplitudes of uh, zero point six to zero point eight. That means that the drum when it's vibrate, vibrating, the drum actually is sort of is uh, lifted up from the surface. It's not directly touching the surface. It's a, there's a, it's a lifted up to about um point six to point eight mm from the surface. Okay, let's let's, let's have a look. Amplitic <coughs> <coughs> blasting. Where is that? Aggregate speed as well. Palestine pressure. Where is that? Um. Ah, here. <coughs> okay, this is a vibratory roller. So it's turning on the vibratory, vibratory roller. So you can see the drum is vibrating. This is a vibrat uh, the vibratory roll roller. <coughs> so the amplitude range allows the drum to remain in contact with the surface. So it's sort of is uh, lifted up a bit, just you know, it's point six of a two point eight. It's a, almost touching the surface. Okay, just that you know. Um, is it, it remains it, of course you cannot have a low frequency if low frequency the thing is jumping up jumping up and down it's too that one is uh, i think we, we we don't want that but we sort of you know it's vibrating at this frequency so the thing is sort of lifted up a bit you know it's look at look at the drum actually it's quite stationary a bit like the um, washing machine you know if it's when the when the drum is turning at the lower frequency the thing is shaking Quite violently, but when it's when the speed of turning is going up further up, actually it's, you see that the washing machine become quite steady, but actually it's still vibrating. That's that you know it's it's vibrating. You can't see the you, you can't see the vibration as much when it's a lower frequency. The whole thing is just shaking like like what, okay. So the the static weight of the vibratory roller. Uh, range just from six to fifteen ton tons. Okay, so, so the, uh, the the weight of the the roller, you know, the six to fifteen tons. Um, 
but when you turn on the vibratory vibratory mods, actually it can um it can perform like uh you know the static roller of the uh, eight to thirty tons, you know. It could double the compact the compacting effort you know, by by turning on the um the the vibratory mods. But so you know the this vibratory roller it can add when you don't turn on the vibratory mode it is a static roller there's no vibration but when you turn on the vib the vibratory mode then it adds as a vibratory roller so the use of the vibratory compaction has certain advantages um first uh, three of them capable of compacting greater depths of granular materials and achieving modified compaction the vibration, the vibratory roller can con can uh, can compact deeper. So actually, because of this, you can have um, um you can the thickness of uh, the the layer of the aggregates you can use put can be can be thicker. Okay, normally we just put uh, the one layer is about hundred fifty mm. So if necessary, you've got a big um very powerful vibratory roller you could put more than 150 mm could you could put as much as 300 mm and obtaining the correct density in less passes okay so you could maybe uh, if you have use a smaller roller you need to do it in seven times but you've got a bigger roller bigger uh, or rather you you have a vibratory roller Compared to the static roller, you could do it in three passes instead of five passes. Capable of match matching the high output of mechanical spreader. You know, just now the one we saw, the the mechanical spot spreader, the one pushed by the bulldozer. That one is a high output. So you need to have a um, uh, powerful roller, you know, with vibratory mode to cope with the. Uh, the amount of uh, spreading by the by the spreader <coughs> the static roller okay there are two types of static rollers used in compaction of the pavement materials um, on the left is a pneumatic tire roller pneumatic tire roller so there's a rubber tire uh, there's a, like four tires in front and then probably at the at the back there are about three because um, they so if they cover up the there's a gap in the at the tire so the the rear rear set of wheels they will just cover up all the gaps okay this pneumatic tire pneumatic tire roller and this one on the right hand side is a st static steel drum roller there are this one they have three wheels so there's no vibration there's no my vib vibratory mods they are just um uh static uh, static mod so <clears throat> okay there are two types the smooth smooth drum steel wheel rollers applying the applying their total weight as a stat static pressure through one of the more drums and pneumatic tire roller applying both static and nicotine action through a um, flexible rubber tire let's look at the uh, what the pneumatic tire roller looks like. <coughs> pneumatic tire roller. <coughs> So that's um instead of the steel drum, this one is just a rubber tire. You can compact the little gaps as well as the shell. The main limitation of the uh, the smooth drum roller is that they have a tendency to ride over high spot and leave 
adjacent area and compacted. You know, this one, the, um, this smooth drum, if there is something, you know, is uh, the uneven surface, it cannot compact the uneven surface. Whereas this one, the pneumatic tire can do that. <coughs> later on, we show some, show, we can show a diagram later on. <coughs> they are more productive when used on a prepared flat and uniform surface, which makes them effective finishing roller. The steel drum roller is um, quite effective for the, for the for the finishing roller. Okay. For the pneumatic roller, compact the materials by static wet and knitting action. So the pneumatic tire they have a um, static wet. It can wet um, 10 tons, 20 tons. You know the and then there's a knitting action because uh, it, they have individ individual tires. So that that tires can have a knitting action. Um, the forward and rear set of rubber tires are um, arranged so that the wheel on one axle ex ex follow the space between the the tracks left by the other axles, thus compacting the full width of the machine. So, so the the tires in front and the and the rear at the rear they will cover up the space. So they will all they will cover all the all the um, space between the two sets of wheel. Uh, the size of the uh, pneumatic roller ranges range from between 10 to 20 tons <coughs> with tire pressure in the range between 250 to uh, 1050 kilopascal you know um, the tire I think you know when the pump the the tire pressure um, uh, probably that way that one is a uh, cap uh, instead of KP, um, you you could do it. I think you you pump at the at the gas station is about two twenty or two thirty kilopascal, or sometimes there is a pound per second. I think pound per inch. Uh, you sometimes you pump just thirty two thirty three pound per inch. Um, so this one the pneumatic roller, you know, it, it could have um, um, the pressure as soft as the uh, the car tires. And then you can strengthen, you can put in more pressure, like four times, make into a very hard, so they have it's very, very hard tires can really provide this knitting action. <clears throat> so the static wet and tire pressure influence the compaction of the, can be very, very into weight. So these are um, pneumatic tires, the wet can change. The wet can change and the tire pressure can change as well because you know it it can change from 250 to um it can change from 250 to 1050 kilopas kilopascal so the wet can change as well so the steady wet increased by ballasting of the body of the machine that later on we look at that uh, we have a short video clip to, sh to see what is ballasting of the body of the machine and variation of the tire pressure to provide a range of con contact area <coughs> so we're going to look at the ballasting and change of tire pressure of the pneumatic tire okay this uh, pneumatic tire roller <coughs> so they have this uh, ballasting space so the ballasting block can fill up the block so to increase the wet. Okay, or can take away the block to become lighter. Or they have water ballast as well. They fill it with the water so they increase the they can change the wet of the, uh, the static wet of the rope of the roller. Either is a block. Five bars and so on. They can reduce the pressure of the tires, and then they can pump up the pressure to increase the pressure. So this is a pneumatic tire roller to change the wet of the um, the uh, the machine and change and also change the tire of the machine, the tire pressure of the machine. <coughs> Okay, the 
ability to vary the tire pressure and the and consequently the contact area and competitive effort in relation to the support capability of the material being compacted is the main features of the pneumatic roller. So this pneumatic tire roller, you know, they can have a soft compaction and then a hard compaction depending on the you know the weight of the body or the the tires of the of the uh the the machine. Okay. Another facet of rubber tire roller is its ability to compact uneven surface. The pneumatic tire, it could be you know even the uneven surface. They can do it you know can can compact a round sur a curved surface, which cannot be done by a steel drum roller. <coughs> Compaction of granular material. The maximum depth of leaves of leaf should be related to the selected compaction equipment. Um. This one it shows the you know the roller how many parts like the red one is zero point zero zero uh two roller parts, the blue one is five roller parts fifth, the cyan is fifteen roller passes and the yellow is forty five ro roller passes, and the depth, this one is in feet you know the uh one feet two feet three feet four feet, so the um, three hundred is about you know the three hundred mm is about one feet. You know, one feet is three hundred mm. So you see the this curve here, uh, the dry density here is pound per feet. Uh, I don't know. I said how much is probably about two point something, two point, uh, two point one, um, what is it? Kilo 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 newton per meter per meter cube. Uh, two point five because the concrete is about two point two point three, two point three. Kilo, kilo newton per meter cube so it could be about two you know the for the aggregates two two point one kilo newton per meter cube so you look at the um, uh, the dry density so based on the um, the compaction you know you, uh, the um, to achieve that you know you if it's too thick you you're not going to compact the thing properly uh, so the optimum thickness is about I think you know the this curve here it's about one feet, one is feet three is about three hundred mm. So, but normally it depend on the the size of the machine. You know, if it's sometimes the machine is lighter, probably have to it cannot compact three hundred. May only be able to contact compact um one fifty mm. <coughs> okay. So to ensure the pavement is constructed to the specific quanti quality standard, the material should be compacted to conform to the alignment. They need to com compact properly, you know, to alignment the grades, cross fall and thickness specified by the design designer. The high strength crush drop material when laid by the mechanical spreader should be at fuel moisture content established by fuel compaction trial. That means that we need to provide the optimum, if possible, the optimum moisture content to compact it properly. <coughs> okay. <coughs> and wet spot or ponding of water on the previous layer should be dried out before any layer has been compact. During the rolling process, the surface should be kept moist by spraying. Sometimes, you know, we need a water truck to spray the, uh, spray the water surface to provide the moisture. The static steel drum roller should be operated at least during the initial passes with the roll dry driving roller facing the uncompacted material to reduce the disturbance of the loose layer. Okay. The vibratory roller should not be operating in vibratory vibrating mode. So you should not turn on the vibratory mode uh you know at the initial stage. In in initial stages, you know. Minimum two static passes in order to reduce the disturbance. Also, you can change direction. Your roller, you change direction. You need to turn off the the vibratory mode. The number of passes undertaken in the vibratory modes need to be carefully controlled to reduce fine cracks in the surface developing. The breakdown aggregates into finer fractions and thirdly, the compacting of material occurring, reducing the density. Okay, so. 
uh, we should not we need to compact properly but not to over compact over compact the, the because actually it will sort of the it will the sort of uh, what's it called um it's actually the, the the counter effect you know you actually you, you, instead of um make it denser it should make it uh, weaker make the get weaker okay so we um so the for this um pavement materials construction and testing i'm not going to cover up to this um the compaction so the next one we, uh, the next uh, lecture we will we'll be doing we we'll start from the stabilization of pavement and ag aggregates and subgrade that we do it next time okay so thank you very much so I will stop here now.